Welcome, I'm Sharon Constanson, uh, Chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce, and we're here to share what is such a big topic in the market and in the world at the moment, and that around the ESG topics, looking after our environment, looking after our social and our governance in life. Now we've got this COP26 coming up in just over a month's time. So the whole world has actually spent a year getting more involved in the ESG environment than ever before. It has been a really interesting transition and something that probably the pandemic has brought positively to the world. So I really appreciate you being with us. We've got people from all over the um, globe that have joined us today, this afternoon. And we have got our individual colleagues from more than one place as well. We're in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, out in the countryside, as well as being in the UK. So the, one of the other beauties that has been brought to us in this new environment of being able to work uh, virtually and have a degree of speakers we're going to have sharing with us today. So please, if you have any specific questions, the nature of today's um, event will be in conversation in two halves. We won't have an official question time, but please place any relevant questions if you have in the Q&A and the interviewer, uh, chatter, host, whatever you would like to call the individual that's having the conversation, We'll be mindful of those questions and if there's something really interesting they will pick it up and bring it into their conversation with the individual that they're speaking to so we have got a number of people with us today and i'd like to, to invite peter and barry to join me on screen peter ashman tolto is a director of the chamber of commerce and we welcome here to welcome him here with us today uh, Peter is a, the Head of Capital Markets and Research at Intellidex, which is a research firm that works specifically on navigating South Africa and Sub-Saharan African economics and politics. If you want to know what's going on, there's one man I only find. find out what's going on and I get told it in exactly as I need to receive it. I would then like to introduce um, Barry Liaka, who he will be having conversations with. The first part of our session will be discussing the finance side, sustainable finance. Barry Diaka is Head of Natural Resources, Business and Commercial Clients at the Sun Bank Group. Then he said something that you probably don't often see written by a bank. Passionate, principle-centered banker with a curious mind. But somebody who believes in continuous learning and says he learns something every single day. And the positive mindset that he brings to life is how he, and he uses that to help his customers and to other people to get their voice heard wherever it is necessary. So we've got two very interesting gentlemen who are going to start the conversation. And I'd like at this point, please, to hand over to Peter and to Barry. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. So it's, uh, it's a delight to uh, have this topic of conversation here at the Chamber right now. We have had a pretty roller coaster dramatic year from the state of the nation in February um, through to the gazetting of the uh, ERA schedule two amendments that that phrase that I come up a lot in this conversation probably um, that's the uh, electricity regulation act the schedule two defines the licensing um, or registration processes for um, corporates and other uh, entities to uh, to produce their own power to wheel power across the grid. Uh, and his, is this landmark reform really a very interesting, unusual reform for South Africa. It's a proper liberalization. Uh, it is a, um, a releasing of the private sector um, to do its own thing, uh, basically. So up to 100 megawatts. Uh, now it is possible that you register a project uh, with NASA, the regulator, as opposed to licensing the, pro uh, the project, uh, a much simpler uh, process um, to undertake. Uh, registration uh, than going through licensing, which involved public consultations and public hearings and, and various things. Uh, and the banking sector really is now starting to get into uh, into gear to help fund um, this uh, this liberalisation. Um, and that's why we're going to have a great conversation uh, with Barry uh, now about this. Um, the uh, initial surveys that uh, Booster did into the uh, process to work with the government on, on this liberalisation showed that there is potentially up to 15 gigawatts of, of new power that could come on stream uh, in the coming decades as a result of this uh, this change. Uh, much of that's from mining in particular, which is obviously a very heavily energy intensive user, uh, but the agriculture sector was also featuring quite prominently in potential 
uh, demand for, for these new sorts of uh, projects, given obviously locations, uh, given uh, the need for, for energy security over very long uh, distances, as well as the fact that many farms in, in South Africa are uh, featured uh, in very uh, rich uh, areas, whether it's in terms of wind uh, resources or, or solar resources. So uh, great to have you here for this uh, this conversation, um, Barry. Maybe you can just lay out the, the background a little bit. It's been a long time coming to this reform, but the, the sector has been interested in producing its own power um, uh, and uh, undertaking sort of risk mitigation around energy security uh, for quite some time. So for, for the sector, what's the sort of journey been to, to get to this point? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Peter and Sharon. Thank you for the introduction also there. Yeah, the world of uh, renewable energy is a very exciting world, and the times that we are living in are equally exciting. You know, if you look at uh, South Africa, we all know that, that South Africa is a signatory to the uh, Paris Accord, and uh, we've made uh, bold commitments, you know, during the Paris Accord. And as COP26 is approaching, um, there are more and more pressure uh, more and more media coverage and more and more awareness generally uh, around uh, green energy solutions and sustainable um, approaches uh, to, to electricity in particular. And it touches many sectors. Uh, you know, it doesn't just touch uh, manufacturers, uh, it affects agricultural users, it affects everybody. You know, in South Africa, we will often say that uh, ESCOM is probably the, the primary polluter, you know, when it comes to uh, greenhouse gases, etc. But what we forget is that they produce the energy and then in industry in general, uh, we are using the energy. So I think we are equally uh, responsible, you know, to affect those changes as we, as we go about. But I do think um, when you talk about energy, uh, especially in South Africa, you, you can't, cannot just look at it from a sustainability perspective. You also need to look at it uh, from a perspective of availability of energy. Uh, when you need it, uh, it must be available, um, and then it must be sustainable um, as you go about. And, you know, when, when one has this conversation, uh, you also have to, to think back, you know, over the past decade, effectively, uh, we all remember when South Africa hosted uh, the World Cup in 2010. Just before that, we had a, a bit, or quite a substantial commodity boom, boom in South Africa, which, which really helped with economic growth. And as the economy grow, uh, your need for electricity obviously increases. And, and we felt the pain of uh, load shedding and challenges that we had where the utility simply couldn't keep up, you know, to date or up with uh, demand in the market in general. So, so there's been a lot of uh, pressure. And during 2010 about, you, you had a situation where ESCOM mainly had a monopoly where they generated uh, basically all energy that's been utilized in South Africa. And gradually we've uh, seen a change. Um, so we've seen uh, the rollout of uh, REAP, the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program, which effectively enabled uh, large corporate uh, companies to do private uh, investments. Uh, it has been done under very, very strict regulatory conditions um, within the framework of the, of the REAP program. And in essence, that's where we've seen the emergence of the large wind farms and, and solar farms, et cetera. Those, are, however, were not truly decentralized energy solutions. Uh, in essence, it was private entities who, who landed the supply agreement, uh, power purchasing agreement with ESCOM, with sovereign backing, supplying into the grid, supplementing ed, ESCOM's uh, power, um, and then ESCOM was still responsible uh, for transmission and then eventually for delivery of power, uh, you know, at, at your site. And then in recent years, um, we've seen that um, operators leapfrog into the space of decentralized energy, where effectively, uh, as you've positioned, Peter, it's now possible for, for operators to, to generate own energy 
literally on their side of the fence. Uh, yeah, and that's been the the journey up to now. But but I think we can drill down on that, you know, as we have our conversation. Great. Now that's a really good background of how we how we've come to this point. The the regulatory reforms are now in place allow a variety of options for you know, agricultural businesses. Right, you can build on your own site behind the meter. Right. Um, um, projects up to 100 megawatts, but you can are uh, still grid tied. But you can also wheel power uh, now across the grid um, from other sites, um, and people can generate power for more than one uh, end user. So, how do you see the the agriculture sector playing off these different solutions? Uh, how also do you see you know uh, technology choices? Um, are people mainly going to go for PV, or, or are we also going to see uh, a bit of wind appearing as well? How, how do you see the mix working out? Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, we've seen liberalize, liberalization um, in that space. Uh, there's still some water that need to run under the bridge. Uh, the announcements have been made. Uh, in practice, it's easy to generate power up to levels of about uh, one megawatt peak. It's a bit more trickier, you know, when you go beyond that towards that 100 uh, megawatt peak threshold that you spoke about. Uh, you know, often... There's municipal municipalities involved, and uh, they've got their own uh, legislation in their space that need to be respected, etc. Uh, the point of wheeling, um, you know, is is very relevant. Uh, you know, you can now start doing it at scale, um, and then when you do wheel, um, obviously it is about securing appropriate off-takers um, and then understanding that comprehensive uh, value chain. We haven't really seen strong um, traders emerging in this space. Um, and I think once we get to that uh, stage, uh, you know, we will see a, a significant uh, acceleration, you know, of that as we go forward. But I do think, you know, when you speak about agriculture uh, specifically, um, we, we, we know the challenges that, that farmers and operators in the agri uh, value chain are experiencing you know, it's not an easy business. Uh, margins are not, contrary to, to popular belief, are not always um, uh, that attractive. Um, and, and it really takes uh, hard and smart work, you know, for any player in this space uh, to make a, a success. And, and when you look at agriculture, the challenge with agriculture is it's also highly capital intensive. Um, and when you look at your investments uh, into farms, into operations, it's, it's really long term, you know, it's, it's very common to see multi-generation approaches uh, where a father and a son and a third generation farm on the same land. So your, your decision making process uh, in that space uh, really lends it towards a, a good understanding of, of long term benefits. And I do think that's where power investments uh, do come in. In a decentralized energy space, uh, when you typically look at the solution most popular being solar PV, um, those assets tend to last for 25 years and, and beyond. There is a bit of a degradation uh, involved, but it's, it's insignificant. So it's really a long-term uh, investment. Um, and then when it comes to funding, as uh, us as banks, you know, are obviously looking at uh, providing slightly extended funding, not maybe for a full 25 years, but up to a 10 years where required. And you're really trying to put the investor in a position where he can make an investment on a cash neutral basis, where effectively he can utilize the savings that he's got from the saving of power by generating his own electricity um, and utilize that, um, you know, to, to, to service debt as one go about. But um, it is an environment where uh, you, you mentioned beyond the, behind the meter, where the operator behind the meter is indeed empowered. Um, and can take ownership and take that into his sphere of control and, and really make a difference uh, in that regard. You, you raised some of the challenges there. You know, we are still waiting to see a fully national wheeling uh, set of regulations and tariffs emerge. Eskom's working very, very hard on that and something that Andre de Rage is pushing uh, a lot, but it probably takes a, a little while yet. You know, the, the full uh, registration process requires some upgrading from NERSA, probably an online system. Currently, it's all very manual, but uh, Ed NERSA amusingly said recently they want to enter the 21st century, which I think was the, the, the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, there, there is definitely movement going on, but but what, what, what do you think are the sort of scale of, of agriculture businesses that can really do this and, and that you're 
uh, you're working with? Is this just the big players or, or is it um, uh, the small players as well that can get access to this? Because obviously uh, up at 100 megawatts, you're talking nearly, um, you know, utility scale type facilities where you're, you can be cost competitive with ESCOM. Um, but some of the smaller ones are probably coming in uh, a little bit over the cost of supply from, from ESCOM. But offsetting that right, you have the cost of unserved energy. So the energy security question, how, how do you see players of different sizes sort of balancing and managing some of those, those issues and those price point issues? Yeah, um, I mean, we funded solutions ranging from about 200 kilowatt peaks to well in excess of a megawatt peak, you know, so it is indeed quite, quite a wide range. Um, I mean, when you look at technology, the technology is also wide. Uh, I mean, you, you've got operators who've got access to feedstock and who can look at biogas type of solutions, et cetera. Um, and, and then the more popular ones are the solar PV solutions. So, so for the moment, I'll focus more on, on solar PV. But, but if you look at solar PV in particular, the, the challenge that you've got is you've got power when the sun shines. So obviously, when you look at the farmer and his operations, it's very hard to go entirely off the grid um, without having access to some sort of baseload supply. So what we do find is farmers will often, um, and, and operators in the value chain, will often opt for a grid-tied system where they start generating a portion of their own energy um, aligned to their demand curves. Um, you know, and, and therefore, it can start off relatively small. Uh, they can cut their teeth on smaller systems. And then as and when they've got a deeper understanding of, of their unique consumption patterns, et cetera, you know, the, it is possible to scale this modularly and, 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 and grow on that. Um, you do also have a, a form of aggregation. Um, some of the larger players in this space might have access to space and, and they might want to produce in excess of their own requirements supplying back into the grid. Uh, the regulatory environment uh, is still a bit tricky as far as that's concerned. Um, where you do get power from ESCOM, for example, they do allow you uh, within very strict uh, boundaries and, and regulations to supply back uh, into the grid. But, but the tariff structures are such that um, if you really want to do it from a cost saving perspective, it's, it's more sensible um, to really generate that power that you need for own consumption. And then the wheeling part, if you've got another site that you need to wheel it to, um, in our experience, it's sometimes easier to, to just leave proc into that space and generate your energy where you actually require it, because then you save that energy that has to do or that cost that has to do with the transmission cost and you don't need to pay somebody for that network and, and solar PV actually uh, does lend itself uh, to that to make that possible. No, I think that's a good point. There's still quite a bit of uncertainty on the costs of wheeling in particular and that will uh, will emerge. And uh, as you said, the scalability of, of, of PV may, maybe challenges that a, um, a little bit. But um, you mentioned biogas, which, you know, we did have a round, uh, a, risk, um, a procurement round from the IP office uh, a long time ago now on, on that and, and hasn't really re-emerged. So interesting if that does gain a foothold in the in the agriculture sector. Uh, now, you didn't actually mention batteries. How, how is the sector, you think, viewing, viewing batteries, the cost um, at these scales is, is still a little uh, uncertain, but yeah, the learning curve, the reduction in prices is, is pretty steep here, right? Uh, there, there could be some exciting opportunities emerging relatively quickly. Yeah, we, we, we basically see three models. We, we see your typical grid tie that I explained, and then you, you sometimes get a situation where batteries uh, gets fit into the system as well for backup purposes. Now, obviously, when you look at your upside in terms of having, having battery backup, you actually has to compare that against the cost of not having access to power. Um, and then when you do that sum, then suddenly it does make sense. So, so it is quite a bit more expensive, uh, you know, than, than a pure uh, grid-tied system, but it does come with uh, upside benefits. And then you also do have isolated cases where you look at the total island system, where somebody wants to do a new development or do not necessarily have access to the grid, um, at all. And in those cases, um, they will oversize their uh, generation capacity. 
store some of that into batteries um, to allow for those periods where you might not have sunshine, where you might have overcast conditions, etc. Uh, the challenge with that is our weather patterns can sometimes be a bit unpredictable and you never want to end up in a situation where you don't have access. So, so indeed, you know, batteries are starting to play a bigger and bigger role as we, as we go about. And, and I can see, you know, we've also seen on the price curve, um, the costs have come down uh, quite significantly, but with the latest uh, commodity boom that we've seen, it does seem like it's plateauing out and, and uh, you know, that we are at that um, bottoming out phase uh, as we go about. Now, an interesting point on being grid tight, given you know, the tariff structure from ESCOM is changing quite fast. We're seeing very large increases in the cost of being tied, even if you actually take no energy from the grid. Uh, for households and for, for businesses and agriculture businesses, you know, the, the, the mass is starting to shift a, a little bit on that front. Um, but but yeah, as a banker, as uh, as, as Standard Bank, uh, how, how are you looking to play into this space? We, we've obviously now seen a huge opening up potentially of investment. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, financial innovation sort of waiting to start to happen. I remember in 2014 before uh, the reprocess sort of got shelled. Um, what, what do you sort of bring to market product wise? Is it going to become commoditized? Is it become, going to become much easier to access uh, finance, you think, in, in this area going forwards? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, as a bank, obviously, we're also committed um, to ESG outcomes. Um, and we realize that we've got an important role to play on this journey, first and foremost, as a user of energy, but also as an enabler, uh, you know, in the space where we help others and so on. And when we do engage our clients, there's, there's basically three themes um, or frustrations or pain points you know, that's coming through. And, and that relate often to, to funding solutions, um, to the technical solution that they, that they acquire. I mean, if you are, for example, a farmer or agro-processor, um, you know, you, you might not always have that background. And then um, the legal and the regulatory environment is very complex. So, so what we are doing is we've set up a platform uh, where we've onboarded certain, certain suppliers, EPCs, and uh, we can enable our clients uh, by connecting them to those suppliers through a digitized uh, process, you know, within a ring-fenced environment where we manage information responsibly, et cetera, and help them then to, to do uh, their own uh, technical solution, you know, by utilizing the EPC. And then we are happy to plug in funding uh, for, for our right clients uh, in that regard as well and then, um, you know, reduce some of those uh, pain points. And uh, then you don't need to face the frustration. Uh, the projects are then economically viable. You put in a position where you can, can compare apples with apples. And, and we really empower clients then to make that decision in that regard. No, very interesting. There are some platform solution, uh, definitely. But as you see you know, more money coming into this space, uh, more competition potentially, you know, Standard Bank obviously has um, uh, undertaken uh, financing deals with international uh, MFIs as well. Uh, you know, are we going to see those terms lengthen that you, you said, um, maybe beyond uh, 10, 15 years, uh, the costs come down? Do, do you think that competition in, in the funding space will, will start to have some of those consequences for the agriculture sector? I mean, we, we do have scale, um, you know, you, you can potentially reflect on, on, on that. Um, you know, if you think from a, from a banking perspective, the, the moment you start looking at long tenure debt, um, you know, there's a significant capital holding that, that uh, is associated with that, which pushes up the costs, et cetera. And if you do have an asset that gives you cash neutrality on about a seven year basis, uh, you know, that uh, it, it might be advisable to try and get a debt out of the way as soon as possible. So, so in our opinion, um, based on the demands that we've seen, seven to 10 years is, is normally quite adequate. In terms of the scaling, we, we're watching the space with interest. I, I do think you're going to see the emergence of more and more aggregators, um, you know, who might try and position themselves uh, somewhere between the meter and the ultimate user. Uh, we're seeing that in the market already, and we are supporting um, some of those operators. But I guess it's it's really a matter of personal appetite. If you are the investor and the owner of land, and you've got a long play as far as your investment is concerned, it might just make sense, uh, more sense, 
to effectively uh, capitalize that asset onto your balance sheet, part of your asset, you know, and reap the longer term benefit rather than sharing with the intermediate uh, in that regard. Uh, some really great points there, but I think the key that come out of all this, right, is optionality, right? And the, this liberalization allows options um, for, for everyone, for, for the agricultural businesses, um, for you as a bank, uh, for the country as a whole. And I think this is why the, this period ahead in, uh, in the electricity supply industry is, is, uh, is so exciting. Daunting as well, a lot has to go on in terms of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the fallout for ESCOM, et cetera, on, uh, from all this sort of liberalization. Um, but, but certainly a lot of uh, very uh, interesting upside uh, and potential. But I think that was a great um, sort of point and opening uh, to this discussion. We'll, we'll hand back to, uh, to you, Sharon, for, for the next, uh, next round. Thanks, Thank you, Peter. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everybody uh, back to our second session. We're going to be talking to uh, Bruce Jack. Uh, Bruce Jack is the founder and um, owner of Bruce Jack Wines a uh, winery near, uh, in Napier, near Caledon. Um, and part that I found interesting is his statement, we don't have a mission statement, a slogan, or a marketing plan. Our life and work is dedicated by the land and the family values and traditions. And they talk about them not being led by quarterly returns, not being led by um, annual um, return, uh, feedback or uh, budgets or plans. They work by generations and they find that, that the focus is around family succession, wine, vineyards that will last generations. Very different focus um, and as they say it, it is beautiful in its simplicity. Um, I'm looking forward to drinking some wine Bruce. I'd then like to introduce as well Jacques Rousseau. If we could have Bruce, Jacques and Charles on camera please. Thank you. Uh, now, so Bruce, introduce you. I can see you on the farm, looking at all the accoutrement behind you. I'd then like to introduce Jacques Rousseau. Jacques is an experienced, uh, he's Group Environmental Sustainability Manager at Distill in the Cape. An experienced environment sustainability uh, area that he focuses on is in the food and beverage industry. He has an MSc focused in environmental microbiology uh, from Stellenbosch has been with Distel for 12, over 12 years now. Mm -hmm. So very embedded in this um, world that we're talking about, knows his stuff in, in terms of um, how the bigger corporations are working. But the fascinating part is how does that apply and get translated to the smaller farms? And then we've got Charles Perry. Charles is a member of the Chamber, South African Chamber and always want to make sure that we all have a good time. Thank you very much, Charles. That man never stops smiling, it's wonderful. He is the founder of Sustainable Future for All and co-founder of Second Nature, and there are a whole bunch more, and I'm sorry, Charles, they're gonna to have to look on your LinkedIn to see the rest of them. Um, he's a member, um, sorry, he's, the, the business that he has is around sustainable um, activities, and he's a consultant and ensures that on sustainability and on climate, that he then combines that with his deep commercial knowledge as of business and helps people to embed the sustainability activities within their business. So if they, if we all like rubs and headlights, so what do we do now? Yeah, I'm a financial service organizer, what do I do? So this is where Charles comes in. And um, I think uh, actually you might be the one who's got the MSc, who's got the microbiology degree with Celebosch, I see I've repeated it twice. Myself. It's you. Yep. Okay. So, uh, um, Charles has got an MBA, if I remember correctly. Well done, well done point, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> I will hand over to Charles um, to take us through an, a conversation of a completely different nature to that that we have just had. The idea is to give you, well, this is what's the technology, but this is the legal bit. Here's what's happening in the real, real world. So thanks very much. I shall hand over to Charles and I'll be back with you shortly. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. It's a pleasure to be here. Already we've got a great conversation going on. I'm here in London, in actually a place called The Conduit, uh, which is started by a South African, a cousin of mine actually called Paul Van Sale. And it's a, it's a hub. It's actually a members hub for people who work in sustainability and impact. So there's lots of exciting uh, uh, themes that go on here and networking uh, to be had. So Jacques and Bruce, we're going to have a chat. Can you both hear me? And Bruce, can you come off, off mute as well? 
Uh, yes, Charles, I can hear you. And Bruce, can you? You can hear me. Excellent. Um, very good to see you both and looking forward to this conversation, which really zooms into the energy uh, conversation. I'll, I'll just preface it by adding, I've spent the last 12 months on the UN COP26 climate champions team and working closely with the likes of NBI, National Business Initiative in South Africa, on launching both the Race to Zero, which is about mitigation, and the Race to Resilience, which is about adaptation, and trying to get businesses and societies, that includes education and uh, NGOs and other organizations, to support um, these campaigns in the run-up to COP, to effectively to mobilize climate action so that we can start to see the systems transformation breakthroughs that we need sector by sector. So just with that in mind, because we'll refer no doubt back to things like COP and both mitigation and adaptation, I just want to go to you first, Jacques, if I may. And so, you know, you've been at Distel a long time. Tell us a bit about Distel in terms of just the sort of purpose and uh, the values around sustainability, if you could start with that. Yes, Charles, thanks for, the, um, for that. Thanks, Sharon, for the introduction as well. Um, so, Charles, yes, I mean, we've got a fairly uh, focused um, on, uh, obviously, ESG and sustainability. Um, and our broader strategy is focused on the sustainable development goals. Um, and we've, we've split those sort of into a primary, secondary, and certain foundational um, portions of those goals. And, and of those primary ones, obviously being in the agricultural sector and understanding the impact of climate change um, on the agricultural sector, um, you know, water, one of the key ones for us, and then obviously energy as well. Um, you know, uh, you know from, from, from the farming side, using electricity for irrigation purposes and through the processing side, you know, cooling, uh, et cetera. Um, it's a key component or input product for, for the winemaking process. So, yeah, you know. And, and Jacques, and just on when you talk about crafting a better future yes, yeah. or distill, what are you actually getting at there? Yeah. So, so we, on, on that, we obviously look at the three elements. So people, our internal staff, and how we, uh, you know, interact with, with community itself. Um, then on the planet side, like I said, the SDG focus um, around uh, water, electricity, um, and then on, on the purpose side, so we have a specific focus of working on with brands with a purpose. And that purpose is beyond just a, a, a product itself, but be also, again, that linkage to uh, um, the environment and the community and the responsible consumption, et cetera. So there's a, there's a big focus of, of including uh, ESG into the way we operate and the way we do things rather than it being a, uh, you know, something you do as a sideline to the business. Okay, very good. Thanks indeed, Jock. And I, I know you know Bruce um, for yeah. a long time. I guess you met Bruce when, when Bruce started Flagstone or maybe even when Correct. he was at Spear, at Spear. Did you meet? Yeah. Because Bruce and I actually worked together at Spear yeah. uh, when I was doing the marketing and, and Bruce yeah. was doing the wine. Yeah. So, so I know Bruce. So in, my, in a previous position, I was involved in the, um, the wine industry sustainability program, which also plays a role in, in this discussion. Um, as it actually puts in place certain guidelines around how the industry interacts with the environment. And again, from you know, the clearing of land to plant up to the point that you've got a packaged product um, and included there a specific focus also on, on energy guidelines. So you know, Bruce has been a, a big supporter of that program and has always been involved with that. So we've had some discussions on developing that, those guidelines and, and obviously the role of uh, you know, biodiversity conservation in that process. So, yeah, we, we, we know each other from that, that space as well, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So turning to you, Bruce, um, so, you know, I mean, just going back to, I mean, you've created brands with purpose, I mean, in this space, right? And you've been a, a leader in doing that from early doors. I mean, when, when we worked together at Spear, that was obviously the Entovens. Uh, creation, um, and you were part of that. But no sooner had you left Spear than you you said about building uh, Flagstone and then selling Flagstone and then carrying on with the private equity firm and then now at the drift. Can you just talk a little bit about when, when you talk about brands with purpose, what are you actually um, referring to there? Yeah, Charlie. Um, well, before I get into that, I, um, I, I, I think Jacques sort of sells himself slightly short because 
the the crucial crucial role that he played in creating a set of structures for the South African wine industry was groundbreaking and um, and not only groundbreaking from a South African agricultural perspective, but from a global perspective. So the South African wine industry um, really took um, this the initiative way back in, and this was the original um, structure was launched in 1998. Um, Today, we, we've got the majority of wineries um, signed up to that. And, and as Jacques mentioned very, very briefly, it's everything from, you know, how, whether or not your tractor operator is, is probably, properly trained, how to handle different uh, sprays in the vineyard, all the way through to uh, all environmental impacts. And, and we, we are a world leader in that, uh, as, as I think with so many things in this gem of an industry that is the South African wine industry. So I think um, that's maybe an interesting background in which to see the, the, the history of, of Flagstone and maybe some of the other brands that I've been involved in, because I think um, if you're going to be a winemaker, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy job, to be perfectly honest. Anyone can make wine. You just uh, shove some grapes in your bath and stamp on them and you get some juice and that ferments <laughs> and it's delicious. So <laughs> to, to have, to have a, um, to give your own life meaning, really, you, you've, you've got to imbue what you do, um, uh, your life's work with meaning. And, and, and I think it, right from the very beginning, when I, when I sold Flagstone, the, the main reason was to get my hands on a brand called Kumala, which was then South Africa's biggest export brand. And that was all about social upliftment. We, we had at the time a stuttering, stuttering organization called WITA, Wine Industry Ethical Trade Agreement. It was very fractious. It wasn't being properly supported financially by the industry. And there were all sorts of reasons for that. There was a lot of distrust. Um, and Kumala was, was, uh, played a crucial role in actually solidifying that uh, institution and ensuring that not only are we leaders in terms of how we look at the environment, but also in, in leaders in how we look at social upliftment. And of course, that's relevant because of our, our poisonous and fractious 350 years you know, of winemaking past with colonialism, slavery, and apartheid. And, and, and those things need to be addressed. And I can very proudly say that the South African wine industry is probably the one that is addressing those internally and on of its own accord with more effect and with more energy than many other industries, not only in South Africa, but around the world, I think. So um, I, I think it's with that background that brands with purpose are easy uh, to, whether it's a social thing or, a, or an environmental thing. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're at the drift, I guess, right now. And just tell us a bit about the drift for people who don't know and where exactly you are. So the, the drift is, uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the, the land we look after currently. Um, it's a farm in the Overberg Highlands, a yeah, little village called Napier, between Napier and Caledon in, uh, in the Overberg. It's really close to the southern tip of Africa. It's wild and woolly. It's incredibly beautiful. It's, it's everything that makes uh, South Africa fantastic. The biodiversity of flora and fauna is, is, is really something that we take huge uh, pride in, but there's, of course, a lot of responsibility in that. I mean, you with very little support from government, of course, we, we have to spend a lot of our own money and time mm -hmm. making sure that invasive species don't come into our, our flora. We want to be champions of our biodiversity for all sorts of reasons, not only because of the beauty that is inherent therein, but also because biodiversity is a key cornerstone of the future survival of the human species. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's one of the things that very few people understand. And of course, farming and trying to operate within a capitalist system within um, trying to care about the future of life on the planet through biodiversity can often be, uh, you know, at loggerheads with each other. So to be, to be a commercial farmer and at the same time to look after your environment, those are the things that are, are, are almost... Um, uh, the antithesis of each other in many agricultural environments, not in the Western Cape, not in the wine industry. We, we take that very, very seriously. And, and I think the whole idea of biodiversity and wine initiative, which is something that uh, Jacques mentioned very, uh, a little earlier, but how, how do we look after our biodiversity? How do we look after our natural environment and survive as commercial farmers? Um, and it is possible to do. One just needs to work a little bit harder and think out of the box a little bit more.
Yeah, certainly there are lots of challenges that you guys have been facing in your in your field, and um, you know, obviously we've we've spoken about some of them, Bruce, um, with with COVID and 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 with resilience, you know, building resilience into the community. So Jacques, just just going back to you, and let's let's talk about the pick up on the energy theme, right? So. With, talk about energy generation and energy consumption, but also let's talk about visible green energy. So renewables are very visible, you know, wind and solar and invisible, which is more the energy efficiency side. So Distel, I mean, can you just tell us a bit about where did Distel start in terms of the energy challenge? Yeah, so, so Charles, I mean, we, we started in about 2010 when I started at, at Estelle, um, putting in a specific, more structured program uh, to look at, um, and, and I'm going to focus a bit on the energy side, obviously, is, and, and I think Barry also mentioned that, uh, I mean, obviously, having ESCOM as a primary um, and fossil fuel-based electricity generator, our key focus initially was on, on um, reducing that, that demand. And we went through a process of you know, putting in metering systems, online metering systems, identifying uh, areas of high use um, and, and, and implementing programs. We work with the NBI, for example, through the private sector energy efficiency program uh, into the National Kinder Production Center. We did energy audits at all our sites identifying opportunities where you could change um, sort of the behavior side of, of energy usage as well as infrastructure. Um, and we've now reached that point where we say we've reduced our base load um, and we're now moving into the, the alternative or the renewable energy space. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've got solar PV facilities just under four megawatts at the moment, um, uh, limited previously to the one megawatt size. So we split over five sites. We're busy constructing a six one. Um, we, we've got the advantage of having wastewater that we can treat. So we've got biogas, biogas into uh, boilers for steam generation. We generate um, electricity from the biogas uh, in control uh, at CSP units. So we've, we've uh, that that focus now is around um, increasing uh, the renewable energy percentage of our total demand. Um, and obviously, there's there's some limitations on that and uh, you know Bruce can uh, can also explain on the smaller yeah. winery um, it's even more difficult and, yeah. and 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 I want to also get into the sort of access to finance question that we heard discussed between Peter and Barry so it hopefully will close the loop <laughs> using that old sustainability yeah. metaphor um, but Bruce, going to you, I mean, you you started with wind, didn't you? I mean, I remember you put up a wind turbine at the drift. I mean, very early doors uh, when you first bought the drift on the back of the success of selling Flagstone, which you created um, in, I guess, it was leased, leased land at the waterfront when you first started. You didn't have your own wine farm. Now you have your own wine farm, which I think was originally an onion farm at the drift. Um, am I right? But did you, you, you tried on your own capital expenditure to, to, to invest in things like wind turbines. Uh, what have you learned? Sure, Charlie. Well, you've got things slightly mixed up, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the farm came uh, actually yeah. before Flagstone, um, uh, but it, it was really, a, it was my, my father's vision um, in terms of the renewable side of things. I mean, in those, in those days, I was running around trying to work out how to survive as a, as a brand owner in, the, in this wine industry, um, where things were changing very quickly. Um, and, and he quickly uh, saw the, the obviously, we, we're, we're a windy part of the world, the Western Cape. In fact, the, the, the Western Cape wine regions are the windiest wine regions in the world. And, and that has huge benefits for us. Not only do we get this incredible concentration of fruit, um, which makes for better wine, but it also means that we don't need to spray as many chemicals as, as right. most other um, areas around the world. But that wind has this added benefit to, to be able to produce energy. And um, it was in 2001. So that is, yeah, 20 years ago. It's a long time. My dad uh, put up a, a wind turbine here on the farm. It was, uh, he bought it in a, in, in a factory. I actually went to visit the factory in Scotland called Proven. Unfortunately, no longer exist. Um, they, they were taken over by private equity. And unfortunately, it, it didn't carry on. I mean, I think uh, in so many of those early environmentally focused businesses, they were run more by passion than by any kind of um, balance sheet consideration. Um, and, and now at least we're starting to see, you know, things like the, the UN um, trying to come up with this hundred billion uh, to, to, to give to developing countries. And, and within that, I think you mentioned the word resilience earlier. So 
the wind turbine was all about being resilient and self-sufficient. And I, I think that is um, something that uh, we have, uh, as, I suppose, as the wine industry, but also as South Africans. The Australians call it the tyranny of distance. How do you become self-sufficient when you're so far away from the market, so far away from what's happening in the world, et cetera? And I think we have that in South Africa, but it's been compounded by the fact that if you're a small company, you know, we know that in South Africa, the, one of the biggest issues that we're facing is a lack of proper focused um, support for SMEs. Um, and and it, it just makes the whole um, a, a fight for the environment, a fight for resilience that much more difficult. But we put, we put up the wind turbine to be self-sufficient, to be resilient. And I think that is the motivation behind most small agricultural enterprises. Like, How do you keep the pumps running when you know ESCOM is going to go down through mismanagement or whatever the reason is? You, you have to be. Um, there is also an inbuilt resilience in South Africans uh, of all colors, hues, uh, we are a resilient people. And if you, say, if you talk about one thing that unites South Africa, it isn't the bri, it's because we're resilient. Um, and, and, and I think you can compare that to, I mean, the bri is part of it as well, right? But uh, you, can, you can compare that to many other nations around the world. So I think the way that we are, um, and I think you, I'm glad you mentioned the race to zero, the race to resilience, because as a developing nation, you know, it's the first world that's messed up the environment now. Why must we pay for it? I think that is an important thing um, to take into consideration. We need to be focused on adaptation first and foremost. So for me, it's about uh, reclaiming and uh, regenerating the flay lands that we have on the farm as buffers for the inevitable flooding that is coming. If you talk to the old farmers around here, my neighbors, uh, you know, uh, particularly my neighbor next door in Boscliff, Taste de Villiers, he will tell you that he's got climatic records going back 135 years on that farm you know, seventh generation and he can show you how when the earth wobbles every 18 to 20 years we get a drought and what's been happening most recently on the farms along this mountain is that those droughts are becoming more and more severe so we've been seeing the impact of climate change in this part of the overberg for 30 years um, and, and the latest drought we had when Cape Town almost ran out of water, well, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are going to see that again. It's going to happen soon and it's going to be worse. So how do we protect ourselves and not only ourselves, but how do we protect our community? And we worried mm -hmm. about what we saw with the Zuma must fall March. I can tell you when half the nation doesn't get access to clean, drinkable water, it's going to be a proper yeah. problem. So okay. I think we, we as farmers need to look after our community as much as we have to look after the environment. Absolutely, Bruce. And that goes back to the sort of definition of sustainability. But I just want to go back to Jacques on, on the energy challenge. So, you know, you heard Bruce had to sort of self-fund the wind turbine. Um, uh, now, uh, in terms of the wine industry and, and access to finance for small farmers to do solar, to do wind, to do energy improvements, I mean, how is that going in, in, in South Africa? I mean, you know, we've had in Europe the various subsidies and incentives like the feed-in tariff scheme which was actually pulled which destroyed the solar industry having created the solar industry in the uk so this whole landscape of of where government is incentivizing and given that the world has largely been subsidizing fossil fuels six times more than renewables for for a long time how how in south africa are you seeing the sme challenge of access to finance or government incentives shark so, I mean, uh, currently there's no um, government support for, uh, for the small industry around um, renewable energy. Um, so it is private, private funding. Um, uh, now, there's obviously the opportunities to do power purchase agreements rather than a capital investment. Um, that just allows you to spread that cost over a longer period. Um, but but th there's limited, um, let's call it support from government on that side. It is basically engaging with, with funders on a direct basis to implement those uh, alternative energy solutions. So there's a great opportunity there, clearly. And, and Bruce, I mean, I think you were talking about solar to me. Are you, are you exploring access to finance for solar? Are you making any progress with that? Yeah, I, look, I loved listening to Barry. I'm very jealous of his name. I think as a winemaker, I wish I was called Barry first. But I was, it was fascinating to listen to him because um, you know, as an SME, we, we really get short shift when it comes to trying to access money from banks. And the, you know, he was talking in terms of seven and 10 years. I've only ever been able to speak in terms of five years with banks. So we, we've had to look at other ways of raising finance. Um, I, I think 
banks should be given a, a, a better a better deal from government to be able to uh, look after SMEs. Of course, SMEs are where where the resilience of a country comes in in terms of how we employ people. We are the the most effective employer of people, um, and and I think um, we 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 so currently we're talking to a new company. It's just been established called Son Fabrique. Um, and uh, and and getting a better deal from them than than any of the banks. So uh, we're going to be doing that. We 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 putting in um, a lot of solar panels on all the big roofs on the farm. And uh, yeah, and then and then uh, again to be able to be more sustainable and resilient. Very good. And I know Bruce Jack Wines has signed up to the race to zero through the SME Climate Hub which will interest other SMEs that might be listening uh, but who might not have known that, that SMEs are encouraged to join the Race to Zero through the SME Climate Hub. And then hopefully back to that $100 billion climate finance and other sort of um, developed uh, world, um, you know, pushes on helping the developing world from a financing point of view, we will see access to finance. But it's quite interesting. I mean, $100 billion is actually tiny. I mean, Boris Johnson just been in, 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 the, in the New York sort of saying to other leaders, you know, we got to get this money together but really um i mean the likes of jeremy oppenheim is well known here in the uk in this transformational discussion says it should be like a trillion dollars it should be two percent of the world's gdp which would be more like a trillion uh, dollars uh, that we really need if we're going to get serious about doing something on climate change rather than a hundred billion dollars which is really it's really tiny but it's all hotting up this this topic of unlocking the capital to support the developing world in terms of accessing green uh, technologies and implements and also and Charlie, opt- I, I yeah. think you yeah, know Jacques will, agree, Jacques will agree with me we have a huge opportunity in agriculture in South Africa in Southern Africa actually because one of the big opportunities we have uh, to get rid of some of the legacy load of carbon in the atmosphere is through carbon sequestration in the soil oh. and through different agricultural yeah, um, techniques and in the wine industry we have this, um, this uh, amazing ability to have green cover crops uh, during winter and then green foliage during summer. So, so we can be sec- we can be capturing carbon in the atmosphere 12 months of the year in the wine industry. And it, so there's, there's not, while $100 billion might not sound a, a hell of a lot, I mean, um, for small companies, uh, there, there would be, it would be so much, uh, so easy with just a little bit of support to be able to get things like permanent cover crops in the ground, uh, training programs uh, for farmers to ex- explain exactly how one could utilize in a mixed farming environment, sheep, in the vineyards, cattle, etc., so that you've got you develop yeah. grasslands uh, around your vineyards, and and carbon sequestration is a huge tool mm-hmm. at our disposal and a simple tool at our disposal. But it starts with healthy soil, yeah. which means we have to get away from a lot of the chemical mm-hmm. stuff like Roundup, which we're using, and and move to more sustainable agriculture, which is what South Africa has been doing ahead of the rest of the world. So, Excellent. I mean, we can be leaders in this. Yeah, thank you so much, gentlemen. I'm going to pass back to Sharon, but really enjoyed talking to both you, Jacques, and you, Bruce. Thanks, Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks very much, Charles. Lovely. Uh, I learned so much, but I'll sum up in a moment. I'm going to ask for sort of final thoughts um, to be quickly shared from each of our speakers. Barry, let's go in the opposite order, and you can leave your cameras on now. Can you just give us some something for us to be left with? Yeah, it's uh, really fascinating, you know, to listen to everybody and and really an hour isn't enough to have this conversation. It's a journey. um, And I think we're working with exceptionally long timelines towards 2030, towards 2050. But the resilience and the urgency is important. And the time to make a difference is is now. Thank you very, very, very sound words. Jacques, can we hear from you? Uh, yes, I think um, obviously in agriculture, and I think Bruce also mentioned it, I mean, we, we're so dependent on the environment, uh, you know, whether or not it's, it's the soil that the, the vines grow in or the sun that we convert um, into sugars um, and then converting that to wine. Um, I think all those elements um, to get to the final product is, is key inputs. And I think hence from agriculture and specifically from a wine perspective, uh, we have the responsibility to ensure that we can keep on doing what we're doing. So it's around that sustainability, that intergeneralization um, um, of, of the product itself. Uh, Bruce mentioned it, I mean, in, in the strain, South Africa is 350 uh, years old um, and we have to 
keep going for the for the next 150 years. So I think uh, it's a key key responsibility on our side to ensure that we're sustainable. Thank you very much, Jacques. Appreciate it. Charles, can we hear from you? Yes, thanks, Sharon. Just very quickly, I mean, in the run up to COP, I think important to put pressure on the government also through the South African Presidential Climate Commission. So people like Joanne Yawich, the head of NBI, is on that commission. So anyone you know who's linked to the President's Commission on Climate Change as they go into the COP26 negotiations, which starts at the 1st of November, and I'm going to be there, is, you know, pressure through whichever channels. Uh, is going to be good because South Africa is the 12th biggest emitter in the world. It's quite, it's quite surprising how big South Africa's greenhouse gases are because of coal, of course. Thank you, Rush. Appreciate that, Charles. Uh, Bruce. Um, I think uh, Charles asked earlier about brands with purpose, um, and I think this gets back down to the, the consumer. Uh, the customer plays a bit of a role. When I say customer, I mean some of the gatekeepers like the big buyers at Walmart, Costco, Tesco, Amazon, etc. But the consumer is where the power is going to lie in the future. As this message gets home to people about how the environment is being messed up by companies that are not taking their role seriously. Um, and, and the consumer is going to stop buying those products that are messing up their environment, messing up their future for their children. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for those of us who've been doing this for so long to start talking directly to the end consumer because that's where the power is. Peter, can we have the final word from you? Oh, thank you. So a major event happened last week in uh, the cabinet, La Hotla. They have agreed now to pass the climate bill to the uh, Parliament. Um, this basically starts to introduce the idea of carbon budgets and the path, these carbon envelopes towards net zero. Um, and when you combine that uh, offshore with things like the EU uh, carbon uh, trade wall, uh, this idea of thinking much more about carbon content, I think, is really going to impact all sectors, but including the agriculture sector. And the optionality that the uh, energy reforms uh, that have been pushed through now give is to allow people to deal with their carbon budgets, to deal with what their consumers uh, want and the buyers want in terms of carbon content, um, much more within their own power. And I think that's the sort of exciting uh, message that's come out of uh, this discussion today and that we, Sharon Wright, will be reflecting in, uh, in the rest of this series uh, in the next uh, next two months. Thank you very much, Peter. Just words for all of you, we will be feeding back from COP26 um, during the last couple of days of COP26. Our uh, objective is to understand what has happened, how far did they actually go this time, is that actually making a difference? But the most important is what is on the radar? What's coming down the line? What should we be considering? What is our audience expecting of us? Now, I could carry on talking for ages because I have learned so much today. There's a language I didn't even know. And we talk digital. We think, imagine somebody came out of the era 50 years ago. They wouldn't even understand us. Well, I feel a bit like that right now. Uh, the part that I enjoyed was the very ending uh, discussion that Bruce was having about resilience and the, one of the strengths of South Africans. And as we've been talking about sustainability, I promise I will be a resilient, sustainable enjoyer of wine. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely enjoy it. Um, the area that uh, you are in, Bruce, is absolutely so beautiful and so um, picturesque. You were talking about, I could actually even see it, smell it, taste it. it, it, it it's such a lovely part of the world. Um, the part that I appreciated out of this was it is a way of life. It's not a pimple that you stick on the side. And I think that is something that in the boardrooms I work in, they're starting to slowly get that message that this is the way of life and this is what is expected of your investors and stakeholders. And one of the other things that was made clear in this exercise was the balance of commercialism, capitalism, investors, interest, money, availability, but equally then what, how does that all balance with what is the right thing to do to the soil, the grapes, the consumer, and all of you. A really wonderful thing, um, a wonderful discussion around what a lovely topic. So I'm looking forward to having that glass of wine together with you, uh, Bruce. I think it will be um, well needed by then and looking forward to it. So thanks to everybody, to Stuart for doing the tech and being with their support, to Charles and to Peter specifically, who carried my role fantastically. Uh, there's been some wonderful uh, conversations that have been going through the chat and um,
Thank you very much for that link, uh, Charles. We will put that link in the um, follow-up email as well. And to everybody, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. That is an hour that flew by. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thanks to you, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks everybody. Absolute Cheers. pleasure. Thanks, Cheers. everybody. Stay safe.